Well, good morning, everybody. Woo, last day of the summit. You're all still here. This is great to see all these faces this morning. I uh, have a lot of thanks uh, to give this morning. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank the Shoshone Bannock tribes for being such amazing, amazing hosts. So can we please give them a big, huge round of applause? In particular, I'd really like to thank, and she's not here, but uh, Louise Dixie has been coordinating all of these cultural presentations that you, you've heard from the Shoshone Bannock tribes. And um, she has worked really hard and all of her community has come together to support her. And I'm just really um, overwhelmed with gratitude for that. I also wanted to thank uh, Velda Racehorse who was just speaking and introduced the film this morning. She's also been working with Louise uh, diligently to get all of these presentations and people here to share their knowledge. And um, it's no easy feat. And uh, it's just been wonderful to hear from all of you. So thank you, Velda. And uh, lastly, I really wanted to highlight uh, Virginia Monsisco, who is back here in the uh, back of the room. She's coordinated all of our field trips. And as you know, that was a, a big feat too. So thank you so much, Virginia. We couldn't, we can't do these uh, big events alone. So there's a, been a lot of key players. And of course we have our staff, which I'll acknowledge later, but um, our staff and our, um, our talk committee has been working really hard to make this a, a really good experience for everyone. So uh, without further ado, I'll introduce our next session. Um, if you look on your agendas, we have scheduled to talk about today's theme. And as you well know, the first uh, few days have been to talk about um, uh, con connecting, was the first day and then to protect was the second day's theme and today is the sacredness of place and being today we really want to highlight the perspective from the native uh, point of view from the native world view and we've had an opportunity to hear from our federal partners on the first day we had a great opportunity to hear from some of our state partners on the second day and today is all about uh, our perspective and um, I'd like to call up here from our uh, Region 10 Tribal Operations Committee, Lee Juan Tyler, Russ Hepfer, and Cindy Marchand. And as they're coming up, I'm gonna in introduce this, this concept. And when we were meeting together to decide on this, the theme of this year's conference, there were, there were three, you know, we, we kind of put together those three concepts, you know, the connecting thing was very important to us. Uh, the to protect is obvious. And then the sacredness of place and being. So we, we, we kind of mashed it all together. And um, you guys can come up here if you would, please. Um, and, uh, oh, gotcha. <laughs> um, so obviously the sacredness of place and being it can mean something different to every one of us. We all have these places in our, um, in our lives that we know that we can go to where we feel good. We know that we can communicate to our ancestors. We know that we can um, speak to those that we have lost. We know that we can make plans and envision a future for our families. Um, and, and that being in that place can make all of the difference in the world. I wanted to share a quick story about when um, I grew up uh, outside of my village. I grew up in much in the Western world. And the first time that I stepped foot onto, um, I, my family's from Point Hope, Alaska. And so <clears throat> the first time I ever set foot and stepped off the plane, I poured my my eyes just <laughs> I I could not contain it I, I it was a feeling that I um think that many of us maybe have felt if you've returned to a place or if you've been somewhere where you 
have never been. And then you, you get there and you feel something. And I felt instantly this connection to that land. I felt all of my ancestors there with me. I um, think that it was one of the most pivotal and transformative moments of my life. <laughs> Still makes me teary. Um, to have grown up separated from culture um, and not really feeling a part of that culture until that moment that I stepped on that ground. So if I can continue speaking and reading without <laughs> through tears, um, you know, that's just one example. And I know that these people up here have other examples that they can share with you about that sacredness of place and being, and also how it connects to the work that we do. So in our indigenous viewpoints, this is something that we're grown up learning and teach, you know, learning how to do from our teachings, from our ancestors about, this is our responsibility. This is not just about us. It's about our communities. It's about the whole world, actually. It's, it's we're here as protectors and stewards for, of the planet for everyone. And I would um, like to invite you to, sorry. <laughs> I would like for each one of you just to take a moment this morning and think about what that means for you personally. What does that sacredness of place and being mean? And a lot of times I wanted to also honor the fact that when we are talking about the sacredness of place and being to us, it doesn't come easy. Sometimes it comes with a lot of trauma. So our existence, our lives, the battles that we face in in our protection of these places uh, often brings us a lot of pain. And so I wanted to offer up a wall of healing. And so on our, our app, there's a, a chat feature. So you can make comments in this sessions uh, area. You go to the session, you can make a comment. Just share with, with everyone else, because we do still have a lot of people online that are joining us. And those people online, if you could do the same, just share with us, what are your thoughts about that? What does that mean to you? And we'll listen to our um, council members or our committee members here talk a little bit about that. In preparation um, of reflecting a little bit about what that means for you personally, and, and reflecting on some of those traumas, um, I would offer you um, the opportunity to post about uh, a vision of healing for yourself or a vision of healing for the, the planet and Mother Earth. And you um, hold that vision with you all day today. And later, as we leave to today, Lee Wan Tyler is going to lead us in a traditional healing ceremony. So maybe we can make that vision a reality for you as you depart this uh, summit and carry it home with you. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Kais. Thank you. Good morning, Good morning. Shoshone and Bannock language. I don't know if you could all hear me back there, so it's good. Yeah. Um made it this far since Monday. Some of our um uh, our talk members went to Water Wheel out there. So I don't know if none of that we should went on a tour again over there for all the other ones that showed up. But uh that's a beautiful place where the water is, springs. We have springs down here. We call a, a bottoms Idaho down here, and um, <clears throat> comes out uh, from way at the bottom, and that's a pier. And then there's right next to adjacent to it on the Snake River on the other side. There's the Snake River Aquifer, huge. That one's as big as Lake Erie, and the Great Lakes, or some say the Lake Superior. You know, it starts way up here, the mountains uh, where Island Park is, and it comes all the way down. Follows up Snake River Plains and goes all the way down to uh, 
to where Hagerman, Idaho is and uh, in uh, Buell, Idaho. And it's a beautiful place. Imagine that wall. Randy's talking about that wall behind us, but it's a mountain wall and um, <clears throat> granite underneath uh, that's flowing. And it comes out, of, there used to be a thousand springs coming out of there. A little bunch of them. And then uh, and that's when the Shishon Falls was a natural falls. And uh, that's where the salmon used to migrate. And from there, they'd migrate down to all the tributaries, almost down to Nevada, down to where it is, it is going to Nevada, uh, where Jackpot, Nevada is south to Twin Falls. Then, then further down, it goes to the other tributaries. Then that there's a river that comes out called Malad River underneath the ground. And then the, then the main fork of the Snake River, salmon come to there. And then uh, <clears throat> the Snake River starts clear over here in Wyoming and go, flows all the way. They call it the Columbia River Basin. There's uh, seven states and uh, Canada. But all those things are sacred to me. They're all connected. They call it the Great Northwest because from the Northwest, everything flows to the West, the river system. And then to me, it's like your blood veins. You get your blood veins, and it's uh, <clears throat> flowing in a circular fashion, just like our body, our heart, and our, our everything in our uh, system. It's flowing in a circular fashion and it keeps going through us, keeping us alive. And then the same thing as the earth, the rivers, and the tectonics, and the magma flow. And some of you guys went to uh, Lava Hot Springs. Who went to Lava Hot Springs last night? See those plumes that come out? That's from the magma. That's sacredness right there. And it's healing. And uh, those plumes come out through little cre creases and how the magma is in the earth mother in the center and then flows out. That's happening all over the world as we speak, but that's why I just want to mention some of that, the power of how life is. And then we're just a small little portion of it. And this water right here, sacredness of water. Because I, I talked to this many times and I, I went to DC and talked to the main officials over there in the um, um, <clears throat> environmental, United States Environmental Protection Agency officials. And then also with the, our American Environmental Office representatives and all the tribal uh, nations in all the regions, National Tribal Operations Committee, National Tribal Caucus, which we are a part of as well, tribal leaders from um, each region. We're in Region 10 here. All the regions went over there, and I talked to them about the significance. See, like we have these two glasses right here. See right here? Then we did a study over here at the Shoban School, Shoban Bannock Junior Senior High School when it first opened up. And I was a, <clears throat> a paraprofessional over there. And then I, I taught a little bit uh, Shoshone language and then through song. In the second semester, I worked there for a year. And then we went into this guy's name, Ed Galindo's science class. And uh, there was tables like this, a biology class. They had a mic. They had a, those little uh, microscopes and all the tables. We went in there. And he says, hey, let's pray over one and leave one idle like this. So we took one and talked to it. And I prayed prayed over it. And, you know, this is the significance of praying. I said, what's well, it? We're, we're, we're spiritual people as natives. We pray over everything. Prayed over this water. That was in 19, uh, uh, the fall of 1996 and the spring of 1997. I was over there and prayed over it. And this other one left idle. The one we prayed over. We looked at the one idol that was just playing. It's like you can't really see anything with so your naked eye. It's real good. Looked at the microscope. You couldn't really see anything. We went to the one we talked over and prayed over. Holy. Everything was just jumping around, sparkling. It was like exciting. It was uh, tiny, little, tiny miniature snowflakes coming out of that. We prayed over it. That's life right there. And then uh, everybody, all the students looked at it and were amazed. He says, that's why we, in our ceremonies, we have in that uh, Native American church, the women bring in the water. And then during the uh, midnight, the men bring in the, pray over the water. 
talk to that water and the significance when I was younger, just growing up, just respecting it. Then our sacred uh, double one, they call it Thursday or Sundance. They bring in the water after our last day and we pray over it. And then all these ceremonies we have throughout the year. And then that's what we was taught as our people, our elders taught us that. And so then uh, we, we did the experiment and it was real. And so holy, and that was uh, amazing. The students at that time, 97, uh, they, some of them that was there probably still remember it, but um, then so uh, that's why uh, that's important to pray and and we don't and um, and uh, not everybody uh, we grew up that way due to the fact of the Bill that was talking about her uh, the history, you know, and the different life and but that area I'm gonna jump around here that area I'm talking about <clears throat> Hagerman, that's what they call it, and uh, Buell, Idaho. They were doing excavation over there, and they they uncovered uh, human remains, and the human remains of a lady. And then they didn't, modern technology, this was right during the NAGPRA, Native Americans Grave Repatriation Act. So good thing that law came about. And when they uncovered her that year, ninety, what I believe it was nineteen ninety six, around that era, era, era again that time, and uh, they were trying to. Uh, dunk, uh, experiment her and study study her but they did for a while they found out she was 19 years old and they found out she was uh, intact they were lucky and they were ex excavating and they didn't damage anything the burial site and uh, they carbon dated her and she was determined to be 12,750 years old and uh, and she still had little uh artifacts with their elements as a young female would use at that time it was made out of uh, like buckskin stuff uh, was like some of the regalia like buckskin and some of the regalia we were dancing with last night some of you guys have uh, seen that some of the they were they still had them, them type of items in there inside and so uh since nagpur came about our people jumped right on at our leaders back then um um, I, I believe it was, um, I think Fred Ock sitting in here was, uh, might have been a chairman then, uh, by Velda, with Velda right there on that table, the companion there, and and there was others, Claudio Bronco and Hobby Hibwa. They jumped on right on it and says, hey, they did their repatriation. I don't know who else was on the council, but back then they brought uh, brought the remains over and, I, and did a ceremony. My grandfather was part of that, but he's gone now. He he he, he passed on over. He was over 100 years old, but uh, he uh, they they they, they tell us a little bit about it, but they no they, they tell nobody where it's, uh, she's buried. So that's kind of sacred too, sacred of being. I guess you want to call it that. What we was talking about, <clears throat> uh, sacred place of being. But uh, that that that's uh, that tells you our people were here for all them years. But the salmon used to run through there. The Dronimus fish, they call them, all the different types of salmon. Big giant sturgeon. When Kelly had, it's a sturgeon over there, water wheel. Call him stew. So I caught Stan Kelly before he was walking out. See, he's trying to walk out. <laughs> hey, Kelly. <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyway, little stew. Some of you guys seen him. Hopefully. He, he, he swims around that pond. You know, it's a, it's a pretty big pond, but um, still, he doesn't go nowhere. But, you know, that's, I don't know how long he's been there. Anyway, that's uh, some of the stories about life, the water people of life of water, and uh, uh, up here on on the land and the air, everything's connected as well as we as it all comes together. And so I'm jumping around here, but that's the importance of it. And then uh, in a short time, imagine that. But that area, you know, my uh, late mother. She's uh, gone now. She told me a story in it, all in an Indian language, and she uh, heard it from her grandmother. From her grandmother, passed down from generations to generations in oral history, legend. And uh, they talked about that area over there. They talked about before humans were here. Talked about animals could speak, the sacredness of it, and they, and then all. The, and then she, she said they were getting ready to do a ceremony. And they all came into the sacred lodge and uh, animals. Ijapa was running it. Ijapa means coyote in our language, and Isha was the sub chief. So he'd be the uh, Ijapa would be the main guy right here in the center of the lodges and 
Isha right here and all the animals are right here on both sides. The, the prehistoric animals, uh, woolly mammoth, buffalo, deer, elk. They named, she named a whole bunch of them. And then she said zebra horse. Then when I was young when I was listening to this and in my mind already, I was thinking, there's no zebras around here. <laughs> I, was thinking, I was thinking that. And then uh, when that happened, uh, later on, uh, and then, then uh, the other animals, and then all the birds were sitting at the drum, a whole bunch of them. They're sitting around that drum, and they're getting ready to sing. Metal art, heat, and then she named a lot of them, we did oil, magpie, eagle, a whole bunch of them that have beautiful voices we hear in the morning time when the birds are chirping and whistling. And then all of a sudden, boom, 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 boom. A big giant guy came walking in, and they, was Zuavich. You guys know who Zuavich is? Bigfoot, yeah, he was the uh, big man. And he came in and goes, hey, hey, how come nobody told me about this ceremony? And he was angry. And then he came, he crowded himself up here right next to uh, Isha. Nobody said nothing because he's too big. So then the dancing started going. Then uh, they monitor each They say they push him on a certain day and make him dance harder. And then, so, and then he he got dagoti eye because they go in there with the dance with that food and water. They pray and fast. They have different things happen inside the ceremony. And uh, so he fell over and saka hukumbuka, what they call it, hukugoyoy. What he said, he fell over, poof, dust come flying, laying there. And then uh, he was all dusty and he was, uh, he was out. And he went into a vision. They left him there, and then it was real hot, and they kept going. Then for a certain time later, he woke up, and then, they, and they, and then he started telling everybody about his prophecy. He goes, someday there's going to be no more salmon. Someday they're going to try to capture me. And then, then I was thinking, that was a long time ago. I was like uh, 16 when she told me this. And then uh, it was all in Tolan Indian, and it was real hilarious how they, in Indian language, but uh, in our language. And then, uh, then so, and then they look at it now, there's a movie series capturing Bigfoot, holy. And then now they've got the Endangered Species Act, and our salmon are almost over here in lower 48, are almost depleted. That's pretty sad. And then um, I went over there later on. I used to work for, um, Bureau of Reclamation, and I was I was help protecting the Arrow Rock Dam, and because uh, that's where they forced our people from Boise, they they stopped stopped them there at gunpoint, and I I was protecting, making sure there was nobody was going to loot loot the area. Looting 2004 when I come out of ISU, I found a job, and that was me. I was monitoring down there, working with Hito, the ones that were presenting the the heritage uh, tribal office, <clears throat> and. Uh, and so I was over there for from uh, September till December. You know, rock Dam, and I then I traveled to that area, Hagerman. Real beautiful when you come down there. There's a the hot springs over there, like lava, and when you come down the hill, there's a beautiful valley, and the Snake River goes through there, and over the thousand springs come up. So there's no more thousand springs. It got an irrigated pipe all over the place now, but there's still a few coming down, and um, and I seen a big sign it goes this one screen right here and it tells about it and it goes and then it said three hundred thousand years ago this area was lush all these animals roamed here zebra like animals roamed here and then that was a hagerman horse and so i said hey that's what my mom was talking about the zebra horse see she didn't know nothing about that sign but that was just stories you know Things that happen, you know, that, to me, that's connected. Through how life's connected, you know, life. At one time, we tell the young people that like we all know as elder elders how the earth was one round, and all the continents were together. They still are, basically, way underneath the ocean floor, and they just kind of the, the the activity of the power of Earth, volcanic volcanic activity, poo boom, separated everything. We all know that, and then geological ways. And volcanic activity and all of this and now that's how at one time it was all connected <clears throat> now it's a we're separated but our people said we was always here 
and so they migrated over there during the first ice age and then second ice age migrated back and that's the ones the scientific theory is that everybody talks about that we learn about at school so they might they might have to be rewrite that the scientific theory and then uh then they say there's a little uh lucy came from africa that came that brought man like that so there's so much but to me growing up uh, everything was connected all the prayers and all of us and then i want to uh, share one more thing Real quickly, 1996, we took a group. It was the same time they were doing a Million Man March, the African Americans to DC, and we got together and uh, I said, "Hey, let's take some. We should do some. Do this with natives, a native Million Man March." But we didn't get the million, but we got enough to go. We went to Colorado. There was a big gathering over there, tribes from all over, and we took a, a group delegation to show back tribes. A lot of us went over there. And um, when we got over there, they were doing a ceremony, and then uh, they were doing t uh, speakers. There was great speakers from all over, but there was one that I still remember. There was a lady. She was a Oglala Lakota lady. She stood up and goes, there's four races of human man, so we all got to do something to help protect our earth for our future. And she says, uh, she said, the yellow man, uh, she meant, you know, I don't want to be a racial, if nobody, the yellow man, Orientals, I guess, supposed to have knowledge and help protect knowledge. You know, you see them now, they're, they're, they're so high tech and all kinds of knowledge, computers, et cetera. And then uh, the, the, the Caucasian, uh, the white, like she said, the white, white people, they're supposed to uh, protect the air. And then here they're, uh, you know, kind of polluting it and all this. And they're still trying to bring up you know, all these laws, Clean Air Act and all that. And then uh, the, the black man is supposed to protect the water. This is, uh, I wonder how that is. I was just listening. And um, that's the, the, the red people, the natives, supposed to protect the earth. So we're all supposed to come together and protect our earth from, uh, from this, what's going on right now. And when I was at Idaho State, I was in a class, and there was a, a book, biology book, and one page had a picture of the earth, and the other page had a picture of the earth, but the first page was 1969. And then uh, the astronauts, John Glenn was way up there in deep space, took a photograph of it. And then on the bottom, they go, oh, such a beautiful jewel. It was real beautiful. And then uh, 1996 again, they took a picture of it on this other side. It was all polluted back then because the greenhouse effect came back in the 80s already and all these things. And so you look at, you compare those photographs and imagine what it looks like now, 2023. Holy, see all these decades, short time, man, you know, destroyed things without taking consideration into the other, other parts of life. But now we're trying to do it now with climate change and is it too late? I hope not, because I mean, it's up to us. A small group right here that's interested still fighting for it. We have it's always a small minority that's trying to champion something. And there's others out there that are just living day by day, surviving because you know they're going to have to make ends meet. But how do we get everybody to get to be in balance? That's what we got to think about: the sacredness of connection. That's a, that's what I wanted to share. I just but at best I could shoot from the hip right now. So. Appreciate it, and uh, I'll pass it on to Russ. Thank you. There we go. Thank you. I have to follow Lee Wan. <laughs> Again, my name, thank you. Thank you, Fort Hall Reservation, for hosting this, uh, for treating me very well. I will tell my community how I've been treated here. It's very important. Very important work we're doing here. My name is Pill Ockton. My settler name is Russ Hepfer. I'm the vice chairman at the Lower Elwha Clallam Tribe. 
In my language, that means strong people. And you're damn right, we're strong people. We're a small, we're a small tribe. We're a small tribe of less than a thousand members and less than a, a thousand acres. We seeded most of the North Olympic Peninsula. Uh, Port Angeles, Washington is in my territory. I'm about 50 water miles from um, the Pacific Ocean. So water is very, very sacred like it is here. I want to tell you a story about um, two dams on the Elwha River. Lewan mentioned, what was that lady's name? Lucy that came from Africa? Yeah, that's a bunch of BS, isn't it? Um, we were created on the Elwha River. I've heard stories when, since I was a little boy that I, I was supposed to go up in the mountains for a, a vision quest to determine what how I would contribute to my tribe. And there was two holes, bowl-like holes in a big rock. One was smaller than the other. They weren't very big, but they're directly east and one was on the east and one was on the west. And the creator would dip his hands in these bowls. And if he came out uh, with different objects, that would determine what your contribution to the Elwha tribe would be. You could be a hunter, fisherman, medicine man. It, it would determine your life. Well, I thought, gee whiz, that can't be true. Well, they built these dams in 1910. And I'll circle back to this. And then they built another one in 1911. Well, the first one, the lower dam, five miles upriver from the mouth, failed. And my ancestors, they were, that were alive at that time, tell the stories of how there was fish in the trees because the dam burst. Well, it was a debris dam. So they got smart and built a real dam out of concrete. The first dam was about 150, 180 feet tall. The second one, oh, eight miles up river, was 250 feet tall, spanned the whole river. No, no um, fish passage. At that time, state law said you had to have fish passage. So the, the mitigation was they built a hatchery. But this, this flooded a lot of our sacred areas. And we worked for a hundred years to remove these dams. My ancestors, previous council members, lots of staff, lots of scientists. And we finally got, it took an act of Congress. Nobody wanted these damn dams. The owners didn't want them. They were unsafe, had cracks in them, holding back a lot of uh, sediment, fish blocking. Nobody wanted them, and it pro pro provided power to one entity, a mill in Port Angeles, didn't even support the community. So nobody wanted them. Well, I spent, well, I'm still spending a lot of my time on dam removal, but I spent about 20 years of my political career going back and forth to DC, talking to people, reaching across the aisle, trying to educate these folks about ecosystem recovery. We finally got it done. And in uh, 2011, they, they took out the first, they used an excavator and took a chunk out of the dam. What a celebration that was. And it only took a year to take that dam out. And then there was a lot of glitches, so that you know they had to learn from their mistakes. It hadn't been a dam removal in the United States of this caliber, of this size. But it, it took about two years to remove two dams. It took a hundred years to get there. Um, and it literally, the the park service is is uh, where most of that river is, the Elwha River, seventy miles, including the tributaries. And, and it's a very high velocity coming down, uh, glacier fed. So the fish had to be strong and robust to get up these balls and, and get to their spawning beds. 
So I know I'm coastal and I may, I may be five, eight now, but I've lost a little bit of height due to my um, young age and all the fun I used to have. But we have pictures of our ancestors packing these 100 pound king salmon home. And then the, the state and all their infinite wisdom decided that we didn't have treaty rights and they started putting us in jail. Even when I was a kid, I had to run from the game wardens. We could tell they were coming because they were all smokers. They never did catch us. They, they caught our, our um, elder fishermen, but we, they didn't catch us because we were faster. But we ran and ran and ran. We'd fish and fish and fish. But in 74, the Bolt decision helped uh, get our rice back. Some of us believe that hey, we got 50% of our fishing rights back. Yeah, praise the Lord, that's good news. And then there's some of us that say, we gave up 50%. I think I'm in the, yeah, we got 50% back because we started with nothing. But when they removed the dams, the, the, the all kinds of scientists running up and down this river, swimming down it, snorkeling, counting fish, doing all these surveys, Lo and behold, they found two, two good-sized bowls, our creation site. This is kind of a funny, ironic story when uh, the Park Service notified us of this because of the, the Natives, Natives Protection Act. We went up there to witness it. <clears throat> and it was about 20 of us. I was the only male in the whole group. And I'm I'm proud of my tribe. We're we're led by our chairwoman, Frances Charles. She's been in that position 15 years at least. Strong leader. When growing up, I had older sisters and, and my mother always telling me what to do. So this didn't bother me at all, you know. Women make us men look good. I mean, behind every chief, there's a good woman. I have no problem with that because I need all the help I can get. But when when I witnessed this, I thought, oh my God, all these stories that I've been hearing are true. I'm from this river. I'm a salmon person. Praise the Lord, I'm a salmon person. Maybe I'm one of them hundred pounders. But it was a, it's an amazing story that's still alive. My mother used to tell me when I was a kid, she was on a tribal council. My, my grandfather um, helped found, found a, the Elwha tribe on the reservation. We got forced from our lands. We signed the treaty. My ancestors signed the treaty. They didn't know the language, English language. And so it's still a complicated language. That's my first language. And I still have problems with it. But they didn't know the language, but they protected us. I'm, I think I'm the seventh generation from the signing of our treaty in 1855. And I just pray to God I do just a little bit of good that they did. Because I have grandkids. They need to learn. We've lost, a, I believe we've lost a generation of fishermen, fin fishers because it costs money to go fishing and there's no fish. We're fighting over paper fish in the North of Falcon negotiations process that I'm also involved in. But my mother used to tell me, son, you have to help remove those dams. And I'd been to the dam, the lower dam. The lower dam was outside of the park and the upper dam was inside the park. I said, my God, Mom, how are we going to do that? To see how big those are? Yeah, son, but you have to do it. I said, I can't do that. Well, you you will help get it done. I said, oh, okay. And then she was telling me the story about, son, we're from the great Northwest. Lots of water, right? Lots of snow. Son, they're going to sell our water. Now, how can they do that? I thought she was a crazy old lady. My mom was 
40 years old, 39 in 1956 when I was born, and that wasn't a very safe time for that age of a woman to have kids. I, I, I consider myself pretty lucky to be here. But I thought she was a crazy old lady. Sure enough, we're buying bottles of water. I don't know how our ancestors were so, so, so smart. But it, it took an act of Congress, literally. We would try to talk to the Park Service, the biggest landowner on the North Olympic Peninsula, about hunting, about harvesting, about gathering, fishing. No, 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 they wouldn't even come to our table. There was no table. And it took an act of Congress to get them to a table. Well, now we're pretty good friends. We still have issues with them. It was the Park Service, the, 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 the Act of Congress for um, Ecosystem Restoration on the Elwha River didn't come with funding. It was just an act to remove it. So we had to find funding. And the Park Service stepped up the whole Western region, put $20 million a year towards dam removal. So they became our friends, but we still have issues. So that's part of the trauma and the excitement and the victories, success that we have at the Elwha. But we've done it with, with historical trauma. Our kids, I grew up with historical trauma and I didn't even know it. That's a terrible thing. But we need to we need to keep telling our story like my friend, my mentor, my leader, Billy Frank Jr., tell your story, stay the course. I think I believe that it's going to take traditional ecological knowledge to save our world, our Mother Earth. They're going to have to start listening to us to save ourselves and them. I have another story. How much time do I got? Zero? <laughs> Well, next time you Fort Hall host tells, I will tell my other story. I want to thank my elder down here. I love you. You you reminded me of my sisters, and I got a little bit of how uh, honorary you can be of the bus steward. So thank you. I love you, and and I hope when I if I reach your age that I'm just like you. Thank you. Hotness and my language, thank you. And in my language, uh, we, we don't say goodbye, we say see you later, and that's point. Good morning again, Cindy Marchand, uh, Hawaii East Squeeze Kid Palks. Uh, I am from the Colville Indian Reservation. Uh, we are bands. We have 12 bands on the uh, Colville Reservation. We were all just kind of uh, brought into there. I am specifically from the Lakes Band, which actually goes up into Canada. And it's interesting that you say that, Randy, about coming back to your homelands. Um, we actually had a big case for our hunting and fishing rights up in Canada. And we had a big celebration last year, June 10th. And a friend of mine who actually makes all my ribbon skirts, um, she went up to the celebration and she just kind of stood there and she said, I didn't know I was homesick until I, now. And so that just shows her geography of memory that, that she belonged to that place. Also, um, for that hunting and fishing rights, you know, women can do anything. And I appreciate those words. Um, I was the second uh, lakes person to bring uh, something that I had hunted across the border. I had got a ram and I could get ram down in the U.S. on my reservation, but just to be hunting in my homelands was just very um, sacred to me. And so I totally get that, uh, that geography, your memory that um, you belong to that place. And I get it all through the river. We we go along the upper Columbia River. Uh, next week, when I get back, we're going to be starting salmon ceremonies. And we have four of them that we all participate in. And we call these salmon back. They're blocked by dams. We put them in there. And actually, they're living still. So our tribe is doing a lot of salmon work. 
but I think um, I just have a short amount of time, but I think I see still some EPA folks in here. I know other tribal folks, I'm probably preaching to the choir, but as far as sacredness of place, I know in my creation stories for the Colville tribes, for the lakes people, us humans were actually the pitiful ones. We are not on the hierarchy. The land gives to us, creator gave to us these animals. They actually sacrifice themselves to us. The berries, the water, all of these things gave to us were the pitiful ones in my creation stories anyway. And so when we try to protect these things, it's not just out of, you know, oh, this is great to have some clean water and, and this, this is, this is our church. This is who we are because we need to give back to the land. I know, um, last night, for example, I, I would have loved to go to your hot springs and see a different part. Um, but I was on a language class. I'm a late starter. I'm in, um, in Silching one, you know, I'm with the kids and, um, I'm okay with that because is what it's teaching me is how to talk back to the land, how to thank creator for what creator has given me this water, this food on my, on the table. And so I'm very grateful to be hearing these words and being able when I'm in my homelands to speak my language and thank creator for all creator has given me and my family. I want to be able to call the salmon back in our language and, and again, thank the river for, for providing to me. And so um, I think it's very important for uh, people to know when we're fighting for these things, we're fighting for our life, for our spiritual being, being, and that sacred place is in our hearts, in the land, in the water, and in all of the people and animals around it, plants, everything. And so um, with my five minutes, that's my explanation of uh, sacredness of place. That was amazing. Thank you so much, you guys. I so appreciate your sharing those stories.